So welcome to the second session of uh, Indian Temple Architecture, its evolution. Uh, as we said uh, in the earlier session, we will not be concentrating on North Indian architecture at first. We will be doing local South Indian architecture and in specific to that, uh, Tamil Nadu region uh, will be the starting point. We will probably move into the Chalukyas, the Andhra, Varangal, etc. as we move down the timeline after finishing Tamil Nadu. So that is the plan as of now. So this um, this intro is also important because we will be talking about cave architecture today and uh, there I will want this to be in our mind to understand evolution of cave architecture better. So what we will be doing is we will be going through Pallava political history for a very brief uh, duration and then we will move into uh, the architecture and the sites that we wish to see. So going into the presentation. Give me a second. I'm not able to. There's some technical glitch. Yeah. So uh, the Pallavas are a dynasty who ruled uh, from, I mean, who ruled even later than 800, but uh, they, they've been there from third, fourth century to around uh, 10th century. But what we will do is we will be dividing the Pallava history into phases and we will view only phase one now after which because uh, during phase one which I define as 650 CE to 800 CE this is my my classification of course some other historian or some other architecture person might differ in his opinion is one uh, one chunk and during the same duration of 650 to 800 in the southern part of Tamil Nadu, you have the Pandyas who have their own exploration of architecture. So, and with the advent of 9th century, you have the Chodas. Uh, from 10th century onwards, you have the Chodas. So, uh, therefore, what I'll do is, we'll do <clears throat> Pallavas from 650 to 800 as a separate phase. Do it as a series. Today, we'll be doing rock architecture and under rock architecture, cave architecture. Then next we'll move into Mahamalapuram and then Kanchi and then go structurally into uh, from cave to Rathas, Rathas to constructed temples. And then we'll go to uh, Pandyas who were parallel to this in the same time period. And then we'll see how we can explore later Pallavas. So now I'm, not, I'm only doing 650 to 800. I'm breaking Pallava dynasty and viewing it as separate chunks of styles. So to give a brief introduction into the Kalab, uh, into the history of the Pallavas, so in Tamil Nadu, after the Sangam period, where you have the Chera Chola Pandya uh, political scenario going on, there is a time when probably between second century to fourth century, where there is a Kalabra rule. Not very much is known about the Kalabras uh, because uh, we do not have much of direct sources of who the Kalabras were what they did, who the kings were, nothing we know from direct sources, when we don't know the reason why we don't know about them also. Around 200 to 300 years of Tamil history is around a dark age. We do not know who were ruling us. But uh, in, uh, with some evidences, uh, uh, like uh, some copper plates of Pandyas, uh, where, it is, uh, where it is said that the Pandya king who came after the Kalabras, um, you know, um, rectified some mistakes that the Kalabras did or you know, some grants that were given by Pandyas who were ruling earlier than the Kalabras were cancelled by the Kalabras. Now the Pandya who comes after the Kalabras says, no, no, my ancestor before the Kalabra gave the grant and the Kalabra cancelled it, therefore I am reissuing the grant. So some things like this give us an insight into there was somebody called Kalabras who were ruling, but we don't know much more than that. But now we are not going to, and uh, therefore we don't even have history and we don't have any tangible evidence as to the architecture that prevailed during the Kalabra times. But uh, to the end of Kalabras, you have the Pallavas in the north of Tamil Nadu and Pandyas in the south of Tamil Nadu who start as contemporary rulers and start ruling two parts of Tamil Nadu. Cholas are nowhere in the scene now. But it is believed widely that Silapadikaram and Manimegalai were produced during the Kalabra time and uh, therefore there are many, many architectural features that have been described in Selapadigaram and in Manimegalai. 
we can probably <clears throat> with these literary evidences we can say that uh, during the kalabras time architecture did flourish but we do not have any record of it only literature literature is available in this regard uh, we do not have tangible evidence as i have told many times and the history is again scanty uh, i have also spoken about these later copper plates that are there now after the pallavas let us, after the kalabras pallavas enter i am not going to go into the south which we will see separately later north part of tamil nadu kanchipuram and the surrounding area enter the pallavas now pallava clan there have been many theories as to who the pallavas were probably some of these scholars were of the opinion that pallavas were not even indians they came from persia and um, you know like many kings uh, even the greek kings who were here uh, were uh, you know were uh, very hindu in nature uh, as we see from very many uh, examples kanishka and the kantharas and etc indo greek indo bactrian kings and the chatraps and stuff like that so like that uh, these there were scholars who thought that they were there was a clan from persia called pahlava and they wrote in pahlavi and uh, pallavas would have been descendants from pahlavas etc which has been proved wrong that theory is no longer valid there was another assumption that they were not indian kings they came from southeast asia uh, there were theories like that some basis was offered because there is a mythology of the pallava kings uh, which we will be going into that was associated with the southeast asia and moreover the pallava grantha script which which the pallava with which the pallavas wrote their inscriptions later uh, on their monuments is found abundantly in southeast asia in khmer in cambodia in laos in vietnam in, in all those southeast asian countries you find the same script and today's cambodian khmer also evolved from the same script so there the, instead of saying that it went from india to uh, southeast asia there were some scholars who believe that it came from southeast asia to india and therefore pallavas also came like that that theory is again squashed and there are other theories on the pallavas which have been squashed just to give an idea as to how history evolves based on evidence i am i'm just putting forth these theories which are all not correct uh, moving into what is the most accepted theory is that the pallavas were feudatories of shatavahanas and this proves right because we will be looking at the continuation of architecture style from the uh, shatavahanas and the ikshvakus which we have already seen in our first presentation to be continued into the pallava uh, style and model uh, sculptural style or uh, be it sculptural style be it the artistic merit of sculptures be it the composing of the sculptures be it the uh, uh, decorative elements in their architectural style we have a lot of commonality with the shatavahanas so therefore it is it is also politically possible that because just when the shatavahana rule ends in the andhra region you have the first few copper plates of um, the pallavas coming up the herahadagalli plates maidavolu plates and charu devi plates about which we will look uh, we will have a look at them so uh, this is the historical origin it is that they were feudatories of shatavahanas they ruled under the shatavahanas as minor kings later they established their own kingdom and because the shatavahanas went into the oblivion they became a major king of whatever land they had uh, from andhra and then they moved slowly into north tamil nadu so earlier their territory was from north andhra uh, sorry south andhra to north tamil nadu so that was the uh, territory that they held this is the historical origin mythical origins what they say is from narayana brahma came brahma had his son and his son and his son and his son so like that it comes to rishi bharadwaja and uh, bharadwaja's son in mahabharata is drona and drona's son is ashwatthama in mahabharata now that is why uh, the pallavas are claiming that their gotra is bharadwaja gotra because bharadwaja is their ancestor and they say drona's son droni which is ashwatthama ashwatthama uh, uh, the indra what he did was indra sends menaka menaka who is a celestial nymph celestial dancer came to see ashwatthama and ashwatthama fell in love with uh, menaka and uh, they had union and uh, to ashwatthama and menaka a son was born called pallava and uh, why was that baby called pallava is because uh, uh, when uh, when menaka gave the son to ashwatthama they both uh, they did not have a bed or anything to lay the kid on to the baby so they just um, got some leaves from the forest they just put it as a bed and on the leaf bed uh, the baby was laid so uh, 
pallava literally means uh, sprouts so from these leaf sprouts uh, on that leaf sprout bed that that baby was laid therefore he was called pallava and they claim that this pallava who was born uh, to the mahabharata character ashwatthama and the celestial nymph uh, who is uh, menaka is the uh, first king of the pallava dynasty and from then on then on they uh, they moved on so their gotra is bharadwaja because bharadwaja was pallava's great grandfather and uh, and uh, that is that is the claim that they make of course this is all mythical we cannot believe in them they are just stories according to history they are not proven evidences maybe it is somebody's belief so uh, this is just something that we can know which is interesting that's all to look at it historically uh, the earliest uh, plates as i said we have from simhavarman and simha vishnu varman these are earlier kings um uh, these are also these kings are also mentioned in other uh, uh, simha vishnu is mentioned in the uh, uh, copper plates issued by other kings of, like uh, for example ganga dynasty who ruled south karnataka had a king called adinita so he in his hosakote plates uh, he mentions uh, simha vishnu uh, simha varman we do not know all these earlier kings uh, uh, for example shivaskanda varman uh, hirahadagalli plates uh maida volu plates uh, are issued by shivaskanda varman uh though it is said that it is issued from kanchi it is all about andhra and uh, uh, we do not know much about these things except from these plates and one more interesting information is that earlier pallava grants like the hirahadagalli plates or maida volu plates or charu devi plate charu devi was one of the queens of shivaskanda varman so uh, from 300s 4th century ce so these plates were issued in prakrit language not in sanskrit language so after um, uh, about 6th century uh, from 7th century we get numerous records till now we do not have any uh, from 4 5 6 centuries we do not have any record in uh, any stone monument is not there we do not have inscriptions nothing we have we only have some copper plates like the hirahadagalli plates maida volu plates and charudevi plates so uh, they were in prakrit language later from 7th century onwards sanskrit comes into usage uh, pallava grantha uh, as a system of alphabets and script comes into usage and the records is just numerous 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 records come into picture and uh, the, we will we will look at some of them uh, when we come uh, we will be looking at mahendra varman alone today when we come to when we come to narasimha varman or uh, uh, the, the, when we come to narasimha varman or rajasimha we will have wonderful inscriptions to read from we will do all that in the due course now um, we will look at simha vishnu simha vishnu is the father of mahendra varman the first uh, mahendra varman is what we will be uh, is whom we will be analyzing today as part of our uh, 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 se- session so uh, mahendra varman's father is uh, simha vishnu uh, simha vishnu is uh, mahendra varman has composed a wonderful plays dramas one of which is the most famous which is called the makta vilasa prahasana prahasana is a genre of drama which means uh, farce or a spoof making fun of lollu sabha madri is something like that so what he does is uh, he may uh, well, let's not get into the plot of the play and all that we'll come to that a little later uh, it's making fun of religions so he makes fun of buddhist religion he makes and he lets the buddhists and the shaivas and the jains themselves fight together and say that your religion is faulted and he says your religion is faulted they all drink and they're all blabbering and stuff like that so it's a very funny drama but uh, he is ready to he is he is making fun of religions through a farce so that is what has happened with uh, matta vilasa prahasana matta is literally drunk people uh, prahasana is literally hasyam hasana is to laugh so the play of farce of laughter between drunkards is what it literally means so in that play though it is just a work of literature and it's funny and all that it gives us a good picture of the religion that was there at the time it gives us a good picture of the temples that were there and it also eulogizes simha vishnu who was mahendra varman's father so these are records that we can get from the literature called matavilas prasna going into mahendra varman so his period of ruling is around 600 to 630 there are some differences of opinion among scholars in this some people say it is from 599 to 629 like ar shrinivasan there are some two three scholars who give a slightly different date but more of a consensus is adopted as 600 to 
we let's not go into all of that 7th century early 7th century is enough for us we are not we are not going to go deep into the history of uh, of the palavas so having said that literature as we said mahendra varman himself was a literate person he composed plays like bhagavad ajikam matrala saprahantaram etc etc and uh, it is believed that upper or trinyana samandar and samba and uh, sorry upper who was trinavakar sir and trinyana samandar both of them were contemporaries of uh, of mahendra varman and uh, they say that he was a jain before and he was converted by upper again there are controversies on this so it is the general belief there are some historical facts that would prove otherwise uh, there are as i said he has written sanskrit plays himself bhagavad gita and mukta vilasa uh, we will be looking at i mean this uh, no constructed temple of mahendra varman survives today probably he did construct temples with brick wood stucco what not we do not have even one of those temples available to us today so what survives of the mahendra varman period is only cave temples and the rathas we will be looking at what they are detailed manner but what we will be looking at is uh, very very less number of cave temples there are 50 60 caves attributed to him a lot of cave temples that he has done but what we will do is uh, we will just uh, be looking at a very few cave temples so, uh, we'll go in this order we we'll start with mandagapatta we we'll look at mamandur we we'll look at mahendravadi uh, we will go to dalavanur just one slide we will come to laitantra pallaveshwara griham which is in trichy and then we will end it with cm mangalam so this is the order we will take and the order itself is very logical because we will find it as we go along because mandagapatta is the starting mamandur a little bit of elaboration mahendravadi is very unique in the sense that it is made out of a single rock then dalavanur is where decorative elements get added laitantra pallaveshwara griham is where inscriptions wonderful inscriptions creep up Uh, sculptures get added and siya mangalam is when you have the pillars uh, having sculptures so i i know i went a little fast but we'll come to this in separate detail so you can understand so don't worry about uh, uh, not noting down now um, and he was going to mahendra varman back to mahendra varman uh, he was of course a connoisseur of music because uh, these pallava kings have this unique attribute what they'll do is when they were can they construct a temple they'll add wonderful titles to themselves and they'll put it there it's like or naam or anna chakra it's like sahasranama madri they'll put to themselves so for example some of his this thing is paribadini daha so he is a person who knows paribadini which is a veena in in kudumiyan malai he has written an inscription for music which has you know sari gama and all that and he is called sankirna jati so very probably he invented a, a type of rhythm called sankirna jati uh many things like that he has a lot of titles to himself we will look at some of these titles when we go on from the inscriptions that we say so monuments of pallavas that are available to us is from mahendra varman's period only not prior to that and then comes narasimha varman narasimha varman uh, is mahendra varman's uh, successor from 630 to 668 is his period and uh, uh, he is what he is called vadapi konda so the badami chalukyas and uh, the pallavas are said to be ajanma vairis so they have been enemies forever and he says that is why he goes and conquers uh, conquers the vadapi therefore he is called vadapi konda so as per you know his again evidences from uh, uh, him are uh, the kuram copper plates udayendram copper plates kashakudi copper plates velupalayam grants uh, narasimha varman Uh, literally it says that the kuram copper plate says he destroyed vatapi and just like you know like agastya who was a rishi destroyed a demon called vatapi vatapi jirnodhava like agastya destroyed vatapi the demon uh, narasimha varman destroyed vatapi the city he just burnt vadami that's what it says so he was called vatapi konda and he is also called as mamalla or mahamalla after which mahabalipuram Mah- mahamallapuram is is named with the consensus that we have of course the city as mahamallapuram existed before asima varman but it was renamed properly like how black town was renamed as george town after king george the visit the lineage goes on after narasimha varman comes mahendra varman the second about he ruled he ruled just for 2 years 3 years we did not know much about him then comes parameshwara varman i am not going into the political history of each of them though political history will run into hours and hours of lecture i am not going into all of that parameshwara varman is credited with ganesha ratha in mahabalipuram uh, 
Kuram temple constructed temple, first constructed temple called the Avani, uh, uh, in Kuram, uh, and then Avani Bhajana Padaveshwara Graham, uh, and then you have, um, uh, sorry, Vidya Vinita Padaveshwara Graham in Kuram. Uh, Raja Simhan uh, comes after Parmeshwara Varman, uh, and um, he is credited with so many temples, so many laurels, what not. Raja Simhan was the zenith of Pallava art and architecture. Uh, Narasimha, he was also, he is Narasimha Varman II, who is credited with the title of Raja Simhan. Uh, and uh, uh, he, he, we can attribute the short temple, Kailashanatha, Talagiri Shara in Panamalai, uh, Rangapataka, his queen also uh, is attributed to a temple uh, in the shrine of Kailashanatha. Uh, her name was Rangapataka. There is uh, uh, Ramyam Rangapatakaya, she has also left an inscription saying that she built a shrine. And uh, it is a small matter of uh, doubt as to if uh, Rangapataka could be the mother of Raja Simha. Many scholars like Dr. Nagaswami believe that Rangapataka is the wife of uh, uh, Raja Simha. But, uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, but uh, scholars like Dr. Shankaranarang believe that uh, she is the mother of, uh, uh, of Raja Simha and the wife of Parameshwara Dharma. Uh, be that as it may, that's a small controversy which we may not get into. So many laurels and titles and of music, dance, literature, warfare, poetry, what not he has given to himself is just wonderful. We will look at all of this, the beauty of the inscription, his life, his contribution to art, architecture, etc. When we come to Kanchi and when we look at Kailashanatha and Kalikishara, we will not be looking at it today. Then it again continues, Mahendra Varman III. Parameshwar Varman the second, and then Nandi Varman Pallava Malla. Uh, Nandi Varman Pallava Malla is uh, was a Vaishnava, whereas everybody till now has been a Shaiva. Nandi Varman Pallava Malla builds the Vaikuntha Pramal Temple in Kanchi, and his queen builds the Mukteshwara Temple in Kanchi. So this is a very, 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 very broad outline of their lineage. We are not going into the political history of these things. Uh, to just give you an introduction and to introduce the monuments that are attributed to these kings. I, 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 I introduce these things to you. So just also to give an idea as to, because when we are talking about Mahendra Varman style, we'll have to know when Mahendra Varman was there and what all he did. So therefore, to a little bit of connection is necessary. That is why I'm introducing. Uh, this is not the entire political history of the color. With that disclaimer. Now, we, we ended last presentation, if you remember, from the Buddhist era. We went into the uh, brick temples. We said some brick temples survive, at least the base of it survives. Uh, so from brick temples to something as grand as Kailashanatha in stone, the transition, if it has to be explained, of course, it is not sudden. So if it has to go, I mean, just look at the, the visual appeal itself is just amazing to go from something as basic as something that you see into your left and to something as grand and he says, in the inscription of Kailash Nata, it is Vibratya Bhran Lihati. It is like as if this is going and licking the clouds of, uh, I mean, licking its, uh, uh, through its uh, tower, through the sh Shikara, it is licking the clouds. So it's so beautiful. And he says, uh, Harasya, uh, Harahasa Rupam. It is like as if Shiva is sitting and smiling in the form of a temple. Truly, such a glorious grandeur that is achieved from something as basic as a big temple. So if I have to explain this, oxymoronic uh, uh, you know styles and uh, scale and things like that we will need to go through what we are going through today which is the rock cut caves so, which is what we will be doing today so uh, therefore you are uh, why why i'm telling you this is you will understand the importance of what we're doing to try to connect this and that we we'll need to need we have to go through this so uh, uh, first, I was, I myself was in a doubt if we have to take up uh, rock cut architecture because that's not what we might be dealing with. There's nothing that's going to happen to it unless somebody is going to scale it off and things like that. So, uh, but then I thought, you know, to understand temple evolution properly, uh, we do need them. So, we're getting into so rock cut architecture can be two in type where the mother rock, the huge boulder is still there, and you we make a you know, slice, chunk it out and we make a temple like a cave into it. So cave temple is one style of rock cut architecture. And the second one is of course rock cut vimana, it should actually be called a rock cut temple, not a ratha. A ratha is something different, but uh, today in normal parlance, we, we call it the rathas. So the rathas is again, this, this must have been a huge boulder. 
So he just goes on cutting whatever is unnecessary, and instead of getting something as raw as this, he's got something as beautiful as this. So that's with all the architectural features you have. This is again rock cut. A huge boulder has become this. That by itself is just sheer magic. And uh, talking about the period with which we are talking about, this is just wonderful. Now again, going into the period a little bit into what I wanted to use this. Earlier to the Pallavas. Have there been rock architecture? Yes, caves have been in existence from BCE times. You have Karavela in Odisha and Kandagiri. You have you have Bora Budur. Uh, you have uh, you know Karle. Uh, you have uh, what not? You have Karle. You have Ajanta. You have Ellora. Even Badami Chalukyas before the Pallavas have started making uh, cave temples. So it is not something unique that the, that the Pallavas have attempted. That is one thing to be said because today everybody is like Pallavas, Pallavas have done cave temples, Pallavas have cave temples. No, there have been cave temple uh, culture, uh, architecture style in India ever since um, uh, from say BC times. Uh, so it's not the Pallavas. Of course, Pallavas are unique, about which, to which we will come to a little bit later. One more thing is, as I told you, uh, during the reign of Mahendra, the Chalukyas did come in and invade a little bit of the northern part of their territory. So therefore, Mahendra had to rule portions of Tamil Nadu only and his Andhra portion was easily lost to the Chalukyas. So, in Andhra itself, in 5th century, you have caves like Undavalli, uh, which is dated to 5th century. There was another cave temple called as the Bhairavakona cave temple, which is still surviving, which is dated to Simha Vishnu, who is the father of Mahendra. So, which we will not be seeing, we will restrict ourselves to Tamil Nadu and from Mahendra alone. So uh, we, we will, with this in mind that there have been cave temples prior to Pallavas and even inside Pallava clan itself, for example, Undavalli and uh, Bhairavakona by Mahendra's own father. With this in mind, we'll have to approach uh, this. Uh, we will not be looking at rock at Vimanas or Rathas today. We will have separate sessions on that because that is another animal to deal with. Very elaborate, very detailed. Okay, so first site, now we will move into sites. Uh, I think that basic introduction is uh, is good enough. Uh, so to move into the sites, uh, first site we will be looking at is uh, Mandakapatta. So what these rock cut caves were, were just reproduction of small mandapams that were there. And in the mandapam, some wood mandapam probably, inside which some deity was worshipped. So it was just a reproduction of a mandapam, we can say. This is the transition period. So, uh, for example, this is the very first cave temple in Tamil Nadu. Very first, first cave temple. So, um, when you look at this from here, what you can see is that there's a clear cut square rectangle that has been carved out of the mother rock. There is no provision to even climb up. Although today, if we see a new staircase is added here, added here. But in the original plan, that also was not there. I don't know how the priest would climb up. Oh, that's a different story. Probably they had something in Egypt or something. Now the cave itself, if you can see from here, there are two rows of pillars. Two pillars are here. And then behind that, you can see symmetrically two more pillars arranged. And there are two pilasters to these sides. Two pillars, two pilasters. And uh, two proto-niches. I wouldn't call them niches. They are not Deva Koshtas. But... Uh, proto niches in which uh, two dwarapalas are housed. Uh, so th th that's the basic uh, architectural style. We will look at the plan of it. Now, looking at the plan, uh, it, it is a it is a plan that has three shrines. They come from the outside, mother rock, and then there is a first entrance uh, that is there that is carved out of the mother rock on projection inside, and then here you have the proto niches for the Dwarapalakas, the two Dwarapalakas. And then you have the plan, now not going into the shrine part of it, there is an Ardha Mandapa and a Maha Mandapa. So the two Mandapas are clearly defined. And uh, the Mandapas, how are they, I mean the line that we have drawn is not because of the elevation of it, it's just to segregate. Now how are they defined is because of the Stambhas that we have. So you have two pillars and two pilasters in this Mandapa, the Maha Mandapa and in the Ardha Mandapa you have two pillars uh, that is segregating the two Mandapas. So the two layers Ardha Mandapa and Maha Mandapa and 
you have uh, three shrines. Uh, the shrine inside does not have a deity. Uh, there is between the shrine and the Ardha Mandapa, you have a small, very, very small vestibule or the Antarala. So you can see three of them have very small Antaralas that connects the uh, Mandapa to the shrine. The, the inscription is very, 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 very interesting. So uh, why I titled the, the different mind Vishitra Chitta as Mandaka Patta is because he says uh, it is written as Atad, but uh, we have to read the inscription as Etad. Etad Anishtakam Adrumam Aloham Asudham Vichitra Chittena Nirma Bitan Rupena Brahmayashwara Vishnu Lakshit Ayatanam. So this is in Epigraphica India. Uh, epigraphica indica so I've taken the inscription from there so what it says is either this anishtakam i have not used bricks uh adrumam i have not used wood aloham i have not used loham which is metal uh, asudham i have not used uh, mortar stucco uh, but vichitra chittena uh, by a person whose mind is very very different thinking Vichitra Chittena Nirmapitam done by Vichitra Chitta Rupena by the king Brahmeshwara Vishnu Lakshita Ayatanam Lakshita Ayatanam he says Ayatanam is a treasure or a temple Lakshita Ayatanam like an aimed project this was done Brahma Ishwara Vishnu to three people who are the trinities of Hinduism who are Brahma Vishnu and Ishwara which is Shiva so this is, he says, it is by Vichitra Chitta because I have thought very differently. You see, I have not used wood, I have not used timber, I have not used brick, I have not used metal, I have not used stucco. But then look at this, I have made a temple, he says. So therefore, I am Vichitra Chitta. I have made a wonderful temple for these people, he says. As I said, uh, we look at the proto niches uh, uh, and the pilaster ends uh, here and there is a small proto niche that comes about. There is a, and then in the niche, you have two Dwarapalakas. Uh, just look at the Dwarapalakas. I'm not going uh, uh, in a detailed fashion into the uh, into the um, iconography or the stylistic uh, uh, variations in the Dwarapalas. Although, if you want to just have a look at it, he, this Dwarapala is in a Tribhanga fashion. He's standing with three bends. One is his neck is bent, his torso, upper torso is bent, and his lower torso is again bent. So this portion, this uh, type of stance is called as a tribhanga. He stands in a tribhanga. He holds a huge mace or a gada in his hand and his ha left hand is resting on that. His other hand is katya valambita, it is called. He is holding his hand to his hip, which is called katya valambita hasta. And uh, his um, agnopavita is flowing. Is, it is a Vastra Yajnopavita. He is just using his Vastra as his Yajnopavita and it is flowing above his hand. In Pallava architecture and iconography, you will find this in many places, which we will again be seeing. He has a Katibanda, which is a belt that he is wearing. Uh, another Katibanda is just going flowing down uh, to bind his waist. And he has huge Patra Kundalas. So these Kundalas that both of them are wearing, the round ones, are called Patra Kundalas because the leaf, palm leaf was made into concentric circles and that was inserted into the ear. So that was called Patra Kundala. And they have Haras, Palaka Haras. So these are Palaka Haras, the necklace that he is wearing. And they, they both have Kiritas. Uh, his Kirita is a little different. He also has a Kirita. His Kirita is a little different because uh, he also has a Jatabhara behind him. Uh, he is having matted hair and uh, uh, and his posture, you can see, is a little different. He's, uh, and uh, so his his vastra is ajanu. He is not having a. If the vastra is up to his up to his toe, it is called aprapada. If the vastra is just up to his knees, it is called ajanu. Uh, so a basic introduction to Dwarapala iconography also we have talked. Uh, if it's too much, let me know after this, and probably will not get into uh, detailed iconography and concentrate on architecture. I don't have a problem. We are moving into the next site, uh, which is Mamandur. Uh, Mamandur has uh, four cave temples just next 
uh, to each other and uh, this is again by mahendra varman uh, he makes a beautiful lake there called chitramegha tagakam and on the banks of the lake this is chitramegha tagakam by the way uh, and uh, on the banks of the lake he builds four wonderful cave temples uh, in mamangu uh, so uh, one more feature that uh, we will have to look at is uh, okay sorry we getting back to the pillars of i mean this the, of mandaka patta this will be followed everywhere so i need to introduce this also uh, where we have the pillar rode lakshanam we didn't see the, the lakshana of the pillar itself stamba itself you have a mahendra's pillars are always stout they are very huge pillars so with that itself you can identify that they are from mahendra's time they they're huge they're just stout as stout as they can be and one more thing is uh it is it is usually uh, divided like this square octagon and square so there is no lakshana for this from the sanskrit texts as far as i know although it can be called as chaturashra and bandha chaturashra potika that is a okay that we can generally call it as chaturashra bandha chaturashra and then the potika in tamil there are colloquial terms that are being used for this so this is called a vet and this is called a saduram so it the, the lakshana is the saduram vet saduram podigai this is this is there in sanskrit also this is potika which becomes potik podigai in tamil this is potika so potika is like the corbel or whatever you call it the, the pillar joins the uh, top portion of the the ceiling through a uh, uh, through a potika and this we, we need to know because this will develop into wonderful different styles and stuff like that when we move on so saduram vetta and podigai is something that we will need to remember throughout mahendra style we will be looking at it and at last in siya mangalam we will see uh, siya mangalam and lalita gura palaveshwara gram we will see how this evolves so keeping that in mind we will move into mamandur so we will there are four cave temples we will go one by one so starting with cave temple one this is a very very simple cave temple 